I don't think he knows. Good evening. 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 Good Yeah, I took a week off. Okay. Went and told this one of my sisters and went to visit a little more that I could go out and go to the grass and feed them. Get away. Is the RC2 enough? Tooled around Canyon Lake and Cave Lane and Marble Falls and Johnson City. Yeah, beautiful country. The RC2 enough? Haven't got one left. Oh, you don't. Most of what I had were hanging on the maple leaves when I evacuated for Laura, and about a half that maple tree came down, and only one of those survived. And he, you know, 28 days I was evacuated. One of those. No electricity for about 26 days. I came back, and. Delta is just going to be a category two. Wait a minute, it's going to be a three. Yeah, no, Those are solid. It might be a four. I like 20, the two ones. 24 hours, 20 hours. Where did the young man make it? He did. I'm back he made it. And, uh, so there was nobody who wanted to avoid the table. Yes, Greg. And it says, Phil. 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 Mom, don't worry. He said, when you there's a Starbucks in a subway. <laughs> <laughs> in Kuwait. Kuwait. It was never a business. Yeah, don't worry, there's a Starbucks and a subway, and there's some shopping places and a few other American yeah, they don't, places. They don't make good companions. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't take places. It's going, no. They're close to the equator, so it's going to be pretty normal, but it's, it's, they're, on the, they're in the same sea as we are. Yeah. It's the south of the equator. That's opposite season as us. Kuwait's north. Think of Kuwait with Israel, Iraq, and Iran. Afghanistan, South Korea, Yeah. They don't have to go. They don't have to go. Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, we didn't have the correct clothes or the correct shoes. It was fun. And now they just out there to take care of all of this. Uh, I went down I was going to my Sunday. Oh, yeah. Oh, 
Before you put it in.
Rick and Cindy are logged in from Iowa. Oh. And Tammy's there as well. Well, she's not in Iowa, but she's there. I meant to send Cindy a message. Good thing I turned on the sound system. I don't have to repeat everything a hundred times. Mm -hmm. And I can talk like that because she can't hear me anyway. <laughs> So has PG Cruises ever going to make a comeback? Uh, that's not me. That's not me. Do not know the answer to that. What age you got to be to be a PT Cruiser anyway? I ain't even a double nickel yet. We did. We did. As we get ready to start, this will be your official two-week notice on the 29th. We'll have our business meeting to pass our 2022 budget. And uh, I'll um, have everything out Sunday that you can pick it up and, and, and look things up, have it ahead of time. That way, when we get ready to discuss it, uh, you'll be prepared. Go ahead and put your ears in. Ears? Yeah, because I'm, I'm using the microphone for you. There you go. All right. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 8. But before we get started, we'll pray. And then we'll dig right in where we left off last week. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us with an unmerited love and a matchless love. And especially at this time of year when people may be more apt to listen, I pray that we would take advantage of all of those situations and share with any and all who will listen what we celebrate, why we celebrate it, that they may come to know you through your son, Jesus Christ as well. Help us to be better prepared as we study your word tonight, Lord. And I pray that it would instruct us and guide us and, and teach us as we need to be taught. May we be skillful users of your word, not twisting and bending it to our own presuppositions, but allowing your word to mold and shape us that we may be conformed to the image of Christ. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son and our only savior. Amen. We're in Matthew chapter 8. We were finishing up the first 12 verses and just to remind you how the chapter begins, we have a leper that Jesus cleanses. The leper is going to be told to go show to the priest that he had been cleansed. And I reminded you that this demonstrates Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. But secondly, this was going to be incontrovertible proof to the priest. Now, they may not accept it, but that doesn't mean it's not proof. You can reject something and you can still be wrong. This is truth. Whether the priest believed Jesus healed him or not is beside the point. This is a testimony to the priest that Jesus has the power to cure leprosy. Well, when we get to verse 5, we find that a centurion has greater faith than what Jesus has found in Israel up to this point. And that's a supposed to be a shocker to us. Well, it was supposed to be a shocker to the people of Israel because Jesus had come to his people, the Jewish nation, and that's where you would expect to find faith with those that had been given the oracles of God. And that's Paul's word in Romans chapter three. They had been given the oracles of God and you would expect them to respond favorably. But here is a Roman centurion. He has such great faith. Jesus doesn't even have to come to his house to heal his servant, all he's got to do is speak the word and it shows that he understands the power and the authority of Jesus. And you juxtapose those two against each other. We've got the priest who is going to have a testimony given to him. And we know that by and large, the priests reject the testimony of, of the people that are healed. Uh, you remember the man that was uh, born lame when he went before the, the religious leaders they even called his parents in. Is this your son? Was he really healed by Jesus? All this. And they're like, don't ask us, ask him. Because they don't even want to deal, have to tangle with him. And they don't want to believe that Jesus healed him. 
Well, here we've got this centurion in contrast to the religious leader who has great faith. Well, when we get down to verse 11, and we looked at this last week, Jesus says that many are going to come from the east and west, and this is talking about Gentiles. They're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This would have been repulsive to most Jews. What do you mean the Gentiles are going to be sitting down with us? Well, they've got more faith than the Israelites. That's what's the irony in this passage. They're going to come. They're going to sit down. Uh, we have the shepherds. If we look at the birth of Jesus from this narrative's perspective, the shepherds were the outcast, the lower caste of society. They're at the birth. And then uh, within a year or two at the most, we have the wise men who would have been Gentiles coming in to find the newborn king of the Jews. Even the religious leaders weren't paying attention to even know that Jesus was born. And so you see that contrast in the birth of Jesus. You see it here in this passage. Jesus said in verse 12, and this is where we stopped. And I told you we would revisit this. But the children of the kingdom, as opposed to those who come from the east and west in verse 11, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The children of the kingdom, that's exactly the opposite of what you would expect. This would be the sons and daughters of Abraham by birth are going to be cast into outer darkness. Why? They're slow to believe. They don't believe. They, some of them don't want to believe because to believe in Jesus would mean they would have to change their way of thinking. They would have to adopt what God's word really means. And it's easier to, to, to enjoy man's traditions and man's own teachings than it is to bend to the will of Christ at times. It's this time of year, so I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll poke the, the bull on this one. Where in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, are we told to celebrate the birth of Jesus? We're not. Now, we are told to commemorate what? His death and resurrection. Now, this does not mean you cannot celebrate Christmas, but you are under no obligation to celebrate his birth. Now, if you let that sink in for just a moment, can you imagine running into a person that claims to be a Christian and they say, well, well I don't celebrate Christmas. You're going to be like, oh, my goodness, what in the world's wrong with you? you know, you're some kind of apostate. No, there's no, there's no passage that tells us we are obligated to celebrate the birth of Jesus as a holy day. It's just not there. It, you're free to, and that's what Paul said. You can esteem one day and somebody else can esteem another day. And some people don't esteem any day. And he says, whether you esteem it or not, you do it or don't unto the Lord. So if there was a person that says, you know what? I, I, I agree with the, the story of Christmas, but it has become way too commercial. There's nothing wrong if they choose to abstain. It's not there. But boy, you talk about mess with a tradition of people if you start preaching that and carrying that around a little bit, huh? I just rub people wrong. I mean, after all, for Pete's sake, it's Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year. What question did I ask you about that, Calvin? Do you remember a couple of days ago I said, the song says it's the most wonderful time of the year. And I challenged that and said there probably ought to be a different version of that song. You don't remember. I remember it's talking about John Morris. Shouldn't the resurrection be the most wonderful time of the year? I mean, because if Jesus had just come and been born and never was crucified, buried, and resurrected, the baby was born. So another human came into the world. It's not what happened on that birth. It's what that birth led to. And in Matthew and in Luke, the angels make a point of saying he's coming as Savior to save people from their sins. That's why he's coming, not to give us the warm fuzzies. Now, I like the warm fuzzies. I like the holiday fuzzies but we're under no obligation. It's not a command. It's a tradition of men. And it's fine because I don't think it violates any commands of scriptures, but we are not commanded to observe it. And so my point being, if we start trying to unravel some traditions of men, some people are going to get rubbed the wrong way. Right? Yep. And I'm not talking about the retailers. I'm talking about people that have no skin in the game as far as making money. They're just going to be like, ah, I can't believe you're attacking the most wonderful time of year. Well, no, that, to me, that's the resurrection. If Jesus was born and he died and he's still dead, 
what does Paul say? We're still what? We're still dead in our trespasses and sin. And what's the point of celebrating if we're all going to die and go to hell? I wouldn't be happy about that. So the reason why I'm belaboring that, I'm hoping it gathers your attention because that's how strong the words and the visceral reaction would be of the listeners when Jesus says, the children of the kingdom will be cast out to where there's darkness and gnashing of teeth. The only way for me to get us to really understand that is to poke you where you live. Uh, Mother's Day, Genesis to Revelation. I'd like to see where we're commanded to observe the whatever day in May that we're supposed to. Better honor your mother and father every day of your life. You, you, exactly. It's supposed to be Mother's Day and Father's Day all, all the time. Hallmark would just love that. <laughs> But again, I'm simply trying to use these as illustration to gig you enough to catch the shock that they're going to feel when they hear this. I mean, that would almost come down to you. Imagine Jesus saying the Baptists are going to be cast out, but but the Pentecostals are all going to be brought in. The Baptists would be like, I mean, a puffer fish, like a porcupine, just, I mean, ready to spit at anybody. That's going to be the reaction here. This is a hard statement, but it's connected to verse 10. The reason why they're cast out is because there is no faith. There were even places Jesus went to in towns, and the Bible says he could do no great work there because there was no faith. I mean, that if you just sit and contemplate it, how bad must the unbelief have been? It must have been just horrible. The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So who's the children of the kingdom? Israelites. Okay. The privileged ones, and I didn't say special ones, the privileged ones, because unto them were given the word of the law of God first. And so they have an advantage in this. Paul argues that if you remember in Romans 3, when you read Romans, he said, what advantage then has the Jew? And he says, what? Much every way, because unto them was given it. So if if we try to put that down in other terminologies, if you're given a car and your neighbor's not, who's got the advantage of the car? The owner of the car, the one who's been given the car. Now, the one who's been given the car can take their neighbor into town with their vehicle. They can allow them to use it even and they can benefit. But who gets the most benefit? The owner of the car does. So unto the Jewish people were given the oracles of God, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and it gave them an advantage. Now it gave them great responsibility, which we learned from Jonah they didn't want. They wanted to neglect their neighbor. In fact, they wanted the, they wanted the sky to fall on their neighbor. <clears throat> but the problem is there's no faith there. So he says, go show the priest back up in verse four. The priest is going to have a crisis of faith. What do you mean? Some untrained rabbi, some untrained Jewish carpenter is healing lepers? Really? The son of God? Really? Look, dude, I don't know what you've been experiencing, but come back and see us when you got a better story. And that may even be light. They may have been even worse than that. We saw what they did to other people when they questioned them. Lazarus was raised from the dead. And what did they want to do with him? They planned to kill him. Now, that's foolish on one end, because if he's been raised from the dead, it's possible you can't kill him. <laughs> but if Jesus is around, you can kill him five times and Jesus can keep raising him up from the dead. I mean, that's but that's their reaction. They don't want to believe. That's part of America's problem. It's not that there aren't enough Bibles in our country. There are Bibles everywhere, even though you have a harder time getting one in Lake Charles, a good study Bible, because our Christian bookstores have just about all gone completely. They're everywhere. You can get Kindles. I mean, if you have a cell phone, you can get a readable Bible on your phone. It's not that we lack Bibles. People don't want what's in it. They don't want to hear it. What you mean deny myself? What you mean take up my cross and die daily? Who wants to hear that? Joel Osteen preached that on a given Sunday. Half of his people wouldn't show back up the next message. And if he preached it again, 
Half of them wouldn't show back up because they're not there to hear to die. They're there to hear how to have your best life now. And Jesus says to have your best life now, you got to die to yourself. That's not popular. That's like going to hear a comedian and you walk out there feeling sad. <laughs> the good news only comes when you realize that you need a savior. Then it's good news because somebody's there to help you out. Well, this is shocking. Verse 11 to them, I mean, 11 and 12, this is shocking to his listeners. But notice the perpetuity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I-N-G, that's participles, huh, Calvin? And that means it just keeps on and keeps on relative to the context. Jesus doesn't give a time frame there, but he says there's going to be weeping and gnashing. In other words, you don't just die and get cast out and you cease to be it's continual and there is a great attack right now the number of people that are beginning to reject the idea that hell is eternal will blow your mind and it's being taught in seminaries as, as alternatives the number of people now that are, are embracing universal salvation in other words everybody's going to get saved uh, I struggle, you know, what do you do with Revelation chapter 20? I mean, you just about got to cut it off. Well, no, what they say is that's apocalyptic imagery, and it doesn't mean what it says it means. Well, if that's the case, I don't know how to know if anything means anything when you adopt that kind of, I mean, you can read Reader's Digest or even better. Let's all go get a copy of the laws for driving around southwest Louisiana, and let's say, oh, that's apocalyptic imagery. None of it means what you think it means. So you can turn left out of the left lane instead of the, turning lane in the middle, even though it upsets people. Because it's apocalyptic imagery. Well, no, they do that to reject the idea that hell could be eternal. I agree it's not a pleasant thought. I, I, I don't know how anybody could think that's a pleasant thought. But Jesus says what? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus, he's not doing this for shock value. Don't misunderstand me. This isn't shock value. This is truth. But this would have shocked his listeners. If on any given Sunday morning I stood up, and I mean, it would have to be the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but if I were to say, y'all look around in here, 90% of y'all are going to hell. Can you imagine the fuzzed upness in, in this church? But you, it's got to be something like that that gets you to think that's how they're going to feel when they hear this. It's true. But some of them are just going to reject it because... We're offspring of Abraham. How dare you tell us this? Well, Jesus is later going to say, you know, um, I'm able to raise up rocks if necessary. If nobody will believe me, I can raise up the rocks to rejoice. Powerful statement when you think about the depth of what this would have communicated to his listeners in this context. So Jesus says in verse 13 to the centurion, go your way. As you have believed, so be it done unto you. And notice this, his servant was healed the very selfsame hour. All of this is being offered to Israel and they reject it. They reject it. All they must do is believe. And there's, there, there's the crisis for all of us. You've got to believe, we've got to believe in someone we haven't seen. <coughs> we've got to believe in a word that we don't have um, physical, tangible proof I can set on the table in front of you that everything is going to come to pass just like God said, other than faith. That's what Hebrews 11 is so important. Faith is believing God. Faith is not the fact that you can prove something. It's believing that what God said is true and that he's going to bear it out. This centurion believes Jesus and he goes away in that very hour the servant is healed. Before I move on, thoughts, comments, or questions? Like the parable of the man that held the feast and the guest didn't come, he sent the servants out to the byway to bring in whoever. Yep. They were grafted in. The parable of the ten virgins. Five make it in. Five, they're gone. They miss it. The door's shut. And they're locked out. It, they all tie together. There are going to people be people locked out. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to life. We just read this. It is very true. But the idea of Gentiles being grafted in is a 
difficult concept for the Jew to grasp because they had such an exclusive thought about themselves. Now, turn that around. Paul warns us about the same haughtiness. If we begin to think, and there are many, Martin, let's pick on Martin Luther. He was anti-Semitic almost as Hitler. How can you boast against the people of God when God's quite capable of chopping us off and grafting them right back in? That's a warning. Paul warns us about that. Romans chapter 11. Don't, don't be full of pride. Then you're in the same boat they were in. Verse 14, when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of fever. What does Peter have? He has a wife. And yet they're going to declare the first, the first pope had a wife, but the other popes can't be married. Well, well they can be married for about a thousand years. Well, it was a later papal bull that said no more priests. Well, that's my point, though. If you're, if it was good enough for Peter, it's good enough for the rest, right? Now, I'm not saying Peter was a pope. Don't get me wrong, but Peter had a wife. Joseph and Mary had kids. The Bible tells us these things. Peter's got a wife. Think about it in bigger terms than this, though. That's just a theological argument to pick. Either his wife followed him around, following Jesus. Or Peter left home and left his wife alone following Jesus. Let that sink in. But what did Jesus say a little bit later on? Unless you leave your mother, your father, your wife, your children, can't have any part with me. Now, we see that Peter still loves his wife. Apparently, apparently he must love his mother-in-law too. Otherwise, he wouldn't have brought Jesus into the house knowing she was sick. I've been waiting a long time to use that one. <laughs> Um, but he has a mother. He has a mother-in-law. Jesus touched her hand. That's it. I mean, he, having this power, it's no great effort for him. He touches her hand. The fever leaves her. She arose and ministered unto them. That's how quick. She doesn't get ministered to. She turns around and ministers unto them. That's how thorough and how fast. What kind of power does Jesus possess? What does he say? All authority and power have been given unto me. Not some. All. Oh. What a testimony. And, and this would have been just as much for the disciples. I mean, the disciples, they're following Christ. They're trying to believe. They're slow to believe sometimes. Sometimes their faith is not evident. Sometimes their faith is really evident. But even this is a testimony to them of the power of Jesus. A little bit later on there in one of the boats, Jesus says to the storm, peace be still. And they say, what kind of man is this that even the winds obey? So for some reason in their minds, healing a person is not as hard as calming a storm. But Jesus is teaching them. He's got all authority. Well, word's going to get out. And so what happens in verse 16? When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word. That's how powerful he is. All he has to do is speak. And he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. God's word coming to pass. To pass. It's being fulfilled because God doesn't lie. What he says he will do, he does. And that's supposed to build our faith. That's what Matthew's point, to encourage our faith by including this here. I'm, I may be wrong, but it's not like Jesus leans over and says, by the way, guys, I just did this so that Isaiah's word would be true. This is Matthew's commentary on what took place at point, some point that he learned. This was Isaiah's word coming to pass that Jesus took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Nobody else could. Even the religious system, as they knew it, could not. And I'm talking about all of their extra traditions and stuff. I'm not talking about the true um, community as God would have set it forth, but at least as it was practiced in their lifetime, nothing did. God's word is coming to pass. Now, if you're a priest, you're supposed to be picking up on this. Man, all these people that are sick are coming in here and showing ourselves to us. They want to 
give sacrifices. They want to be declared clean. Man, this almost sounds like Isaiah, but they don't want to listen to that because to listen to that means Jesus is who? He's, He's the Messiah. The and if Jesus is the Messiah, we've got to yield our allegiance and who we are and what we are to him. Uh-uh. He's a carpenter. He's not one of us. He's not a trained rabbi. Who does he think he is? But all of these testimonies are who Jesus is. In fact, we've got the, uh, the prophecies here that many are going to come from the east and west. We've got the the leper going and showing himself to the priest. We've got here all of these people bringing their sick, their devils uh, possessed to, to Jesus. He's healing them all. And the writer, Matthew, says all of this testifies that Jesus is Messiah. You won't go wrong trusting in him. Now, he's going to start collecting crowds of people because a lot of people are now hearing, oh, look what he's doing. Let's go watch some more. This is not increasing faith. They're there for the sideshow. So Jesus says to, uh, when he sees the great multitudes about him, he gives commandment to depart unto the other side to his disciples. And a certain scribe came un and said unto him, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. You ever thought that? Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Be careful. <laughs> Jesus looks at him. And he lays the truth out before him. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. In other words, I'm not going to stay in a home. I'm not here to live in a castle. I'm going to be a man of the road, and this is my life. You're going to follow me. You can't be held down by the trappings of life. It may seem brutish to some, but there are some missionary sending groups they will not let their family, the people that they send out, have contact with their families for a year. Once they're on the field, no contact with the families. But there's a good reason for that. It breaks that cord. It cuts that rope so that they're not compelled to go back home. You say you've got the call of Christ in your life, that Christ has called you to be a missionary. Well, you can't be at home and be a missionary on the field at the same time. If you're going to serve in the field, you got to leave home behind. And what they're saying is we're not going to invest six, 10, 15, 18 thousand dollars in a person only for them to be on the field for a month and a half, get a phone call that things aren't good at home and they can go back home. They say that's not being a good steward. If you're going to follow Christ, you're going to follow what Jesus said. A lot of people want to follow him, but people don't want to give up. They don't want to make that sacrifice. Another disciple said unto him, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. And of all things, Jesus ought to be willing to do that, right? Jesus said unto him, follow me, let the dead bury the dead. Funerals is another sore spot for people. <laughs> Suppose a pastor is on vacation with his wife. And smack dab in the middle of it, he gets a phone call that somebody wants him to do a funeral. Should the pastor go back? Or should he continue to nurture his relationship with his wife who is alive? Mm -hmm. Maybe he's an elder or a board member. Uh, yeah, it's not like there's only one godly man in town that can speak. <laughs> we got refrigerators. They'll be well, there. They're going to be there. You got that too. Wait till the week's up. They're there. But Jesus, Jesus pokes. I mean, this is a sore spot. Not only then, it's a sore spot now. In fact, even back then, depending on how wealthy you were, determined how long you mourned. I mean, if you if you were poor, you mean they might mourn for you half a day. It's just it's how many mourners you could hire to really raise a ruckus. And Jesus said, "You you let the dead go bury the dead." Now look. The guy said, allow me to go bury my father. Jesus said, leave him behind. You follow me. Ooh, leave your father. What kind of allegiance does Jesus demand of us? There's only room in our life for one Lord. I'll tell you what, though, when COVID first started, people had no choices. And I mean, this is the Lord, you know? So 
Yeah. It, and they didn't hesitate to stay home. But when it happens under the name of Christ, though, it people just it's like rubbing a cat backwards. It, it was for them, too. This was important. How you mourn the dead. Jesus said they're dead. So it's also one of my pet peeves. Why do we try to make dead people look alive? We're not there because they're alive. We're there because they're what? Dead. dead. Well, maybe the dead face would scare us. Maybe it would shock some sense in the people. This is what death looks like. Death isn't pretty. Death is our enemy. But we want to remember them as they were or reflect on them in your mind. But why are you going to pretend that they're not what they are? And maybe if we add enough flowers to it, it'll make it palatable. Well, no, the bad part about that is we cut the flowers off, stuck them in the spray. What are they going to do? They're going to die, too. We're just surrounded by death. And for most people, you give us little plants that have to be watered and kept up. About a month later, what happens to most of them? They're dead, too. We're surrounded by death, but we try to make it look alive. I don't think I've ever seen a dead person that was made up that looked like themselves. About the only time that I can say a person that I believe they looked like themselves is if they were killed immediately. If something happened, and I'm not talking about gunshot wounds to the face or whatever, but a young person having a heart attack, they were not sick. They're going to look pretty much like themselves. Most people that die over a period of a year, two, three years, cancer or whatever, by the time death has done its work on them, they don't look anything like the person, but that's death. And, you know, when my mom died, she had been sick for like four years and going down, and she looked terrible. And when we were at the funeral home that we used in Jennings, when we were there, to, I was scared to walk in. And they made my mama look 20 years Mm -hmm. younger than what she did she looked they made her he did a fantastic job with my mom but paul said he noticed me hesitate because i didn't know what i was going to see when i got in there and my mama looked like she had 20 years earlier so so why do we do that then why do we do that (laughs) because we can't handle death we don't want to think they're dead and Jesus said, I don't care if it's your father. Let, him, let, them, let them go take care of the dead. They're dead. You come follow me. Yeah, Sounds the harsh. Next time he comes home, his mama's going to lay into him. <laughs> yeah, but all he's got to say is, I follow Jesus. There is no guilt she can heap on him that if he trusts Christ, that is his to bear. And there's a real truth there. If you're obeying Christ, I don't care what everybody else tells you. If you are really being obedient, let them try. But you don't buy into it one bit whatsoever. So if the guy left and his mama was upset when he comes back, all he's got to say is, I did what Christ commanded me. But that's that's the rub. Who really wants to do what Christ commands when it comes to these things? Deny myself, deny my family. To deny comforts of home, wear wear Bermuda shorts and round hats getting eaten by mosquitoes. I can't say that the young guy that got in the canoe that went to that island he wasn't supposed to be at directly heard from Jesus. It was his testimony. That's what he was supposed to do. And I would have to take him at his word. But he doesn't last very long on the island. They fill him full of arrows. Does that mean that Jesus wasn't, that Jesus didn't tell him to go? No, Jesus could have very well been the one that told him to go. But this is how they're going to introduce these people to Christ. But society says we need to leave them unspoiled. We need to leave them untouched, which means if they are not um, evangelized, they're going to die and go to hell. This guy had enough within him that even if it cost him his life, he was going there. That's a testimony. Now I'm going to say, make sure you listen to Jesus. But what a testimony. Y'all ready for me to move forward? So, when he entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Fascinating picture. Water's crashing over the bow, sea spray, the boat's rocking. 
and Jesus is zonked out. Jesus ain't worried. It's not, it's not that the disciples can all float. He's just not concerned. And if you got Jesus in the boat, why would you be concerned? If you know Jesus is in the fire because he didn't get out when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were pulled out, if you already know Jesus is there, why would we be concerned? His disciples came to him and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we perish. I don't think Jesus is upset. The best thing they could have done would have been in faith. Well, let's go sit by Jesus. Maybe this part of the boat's going to survive. <laughs> that would have been faith. Lord, wake up. We're all dying. Well, nobody's dying. If Jesus is asleep, there's nobody in danger of dying. It's fine. And even when he got word that Lazarus was dying, he was in no hurry to get to Lazarus because he knew what he was able to do. Look what he says to him in verse 26. Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Why are you afraid? What's wrong with you? What part of having me in your boat don't you get? Where's your faith? But no, what do we want to be? We want to be ta ta Dare, dare, it'll be all right. Jesus says, hold on a minute. Where's your faith? If your loved one died professing faith in Christ, and we know what the scripture says, why are you completely losing it? Where's your faith at? They're alive now more than they were when they were here. Why are you freaking? It's not that you don't hurt, but you shouldn't be overcome by your emotions. And the, these disciples, they're all overcome by their fear. And he says, oh, ye of little faith. I'm telling you, he didn't take Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People course. He just didn't. Because he says all the wrong things. But that is part of the problem with our society. We know how to fluff people up and blow smoke and tie them, but nobody wants to say, the, dude, you're responsible for your actions. Nobody made you do squat. It's going to be quite interesting how it plays out up north. The parents that bought their son the pistol or the gun or whatever it was, which he shouldn't have been bought. And he went and killed the people. The school knew he was capable of stupid stuff, but they did nothing. The parents knew what he was capable of, and they did nothing. But everybody wants to blame something else. Oh, it's the gun's fault. Yeah, that gun jumped up and said, you can't help it, buddy. you got to pull the trigger. Whatever. It's funny we're not wanting to, to ban cars. People kill others with cars. I, I, I think, honestly, down here, we're more at danger of getting hit by a drunk driver than, or, a, or a great fast speeder than we are somebody walking into Walmart shooting up while we happen to be there. Everybody wants to blame something else. Jesus looks at him and says, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? Where is your faith? That doesn't mean there's not a storm there. That's, he didn't say, well, you don't really see a storm. Where's your faith in the one that's in the boat? He can heal the leper. He can heal the centurion servant over a great distance. He healed Peter's mother with a touch. Devils have come into the house. They've been cleansed. Other sick people have brought to the house. They've been cleansed. Jesus says, why don't you believe me? Why don't you have hope in me? Fast forward three years. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Why do we doubt for a moment his power? If he can, if he can overcome death, what is there he cannot do? Like I said, you know, if Lazarus can be raised from the dead, you can kill him a number of times, but you're going to run into the possibility he's going to keep popping right back up. They did that with Paul. They stoned him. They brought him outside the city, threw him on the rock pile. We're not told that God raised him up, but we know that's what happened. Gets up, cleans himself off, and he goes right back into town. Well, what's the point of stoning him if he's just going to keep doing this? Maybe I need to listen to what the man's saying. And everything that Jesus has done 
has up to this point. He arose, he rebuked the winds and the sea. There was a great calm and the men marveled saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Matthew's laying out that Jesus has all power and authority. Now let's take this on the hills of just coming down off the mountain. If Jesus has all power and authority, he is right to tell us how we're supposed to live in chapter five through chapter seven. Jesus is right when he says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Oh no, that's hyperbole. Really? Jesus said, why would you go to hell with your entire body with you as opposed to being able to go into heaven having lost a hand or an eye? Who has the authority to make that statement? Jesus does. So if, if a, a preacher, a teacher, a parent teaching their kids, if they're teaching what the word says, it's not true because we have authority. It's true because the one that spoke it had the authority. And so that's what we're believing, not the a person's interpretation of it, but what Jesus said. I believe Jesus calmed the storm. Why? His word says so. And who in the world would write about themselves? Man, we were really pathetic. There's a storm and we're freaking out. We got seasoned boaters. They've ne it's not like they never saw a storm on the sea. And we were all petrified and we went, woke up the carpenter and carpenters, you know, they're landlubbers. And we had to go wake up the carpenter because we didn't believe. Who would write that about themselves? No, what would we do? Well, it really wasn't that bad. We're going to make ourselves look better. The testimony is these guys said we were rotten. We had no faith. Jesus said, where your faith? We couldn't get over the fact that he had power over the winds and the sea. They obey him. Matthew's teaching us that he learned Jesus has all power. All authority. I, I'm just think, I'm thinking through this. I should. Sometimes I say, man, I should have, I should have thought of this earlier, but it's just the way it is. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Look at that with me. This will give you the, the understanding that this is the word of God's cohesive. Matthew's making a point. He does it again, quoting Jesus and. Verse 18 of the last chapter, Matthew 28, Jesus came and spoke unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. How much? All power. If he calls you to obey him today, what do you have to be afraid of? He's got the power. And if something happens to you, it's not because he's weak. He's got something he's doing and he's working it out. Are you willing to give it all up to follow him? Are you willing to forsake others to follow him? Are you willing to cast your faith into the basket of Jesus? What is there he can't do? Now, we're going to be careful. We're not going to be presumptuous that he will in every situation for us, right? Right? Because we saw that earlier in chapter 8. Jesus said to the leper, what would you have of me? He said, if you will, you can make me clean. He didn't doubt his power. What he says is, I don't know whether that's your desire to heal me or not. He doesn't doubt Jesus can. Jesus could eliminate all of your problems. He really could. No, I don't care what it is, if it's health, if it's financial, if you're like, man, I need to stick around another X years till Courtney reaches this. Jesus said, no problem. In fact, I'll let you stick around till she has her own kids. And you're thinking, well, you know, I might be ready to go by that time. But <laughs> there is nothing that you're facing that Jesus doesn't have power to remedy. And you've got to believe that. Otherwise, you don't have a real savior. If he, he can't do it, what do you already know? That's not the problem. He knows it. We don't. That's the rub. We say we do, but we don't believe him. Otherwise, we wouldn't gripe, complain, get all affected, get our hair in a tizzy. Doctor says you got six months to live. Oh, man, the world's caving in. Really? Did it catch Jesus by surprise? Caught us by surprise. Yes. Did it catch him by surprise? No. One of our teachers at school, her brother-in-law just died, but they've been telling them 
since October that he had a week or he had days or and the man just died so she's like we've been going through this emotional roller coaster since October instead of just enjoying the time you have with him I mean because you don't know I mean this we I say this all the time yeah we look at some in here and y'all are a little closer to the end of the abacus than brother Luke that's going to be my point. We assume that because the fewer chips you have on your abacus to slide over means you're coming to an end. I could go tomorrow. I may not even make it home tonight. Does that mean Jesus can't? No. And so I'm encouraging us, don't be presumptuous about what he's going to do, but never doubt what he is able to do. He could have saved the missionaries, the, the book through Gates of Splendor. He could have saved the Elliots down there, but he didn't. But then he used the wives of the slain men. They go back and the tribesmen and even the ones that killed them get saved. Don't doubt the power of Jesus. He's got all power and authority. Just don't presume to tell him what he's going to do. He's not a giant cosmic vending machine. You don't put a prayer in and get what you ask far out in that form. We know he's capable. We know he's able. And so when we were praying for Corley, we knew he could make it work out. We just didn't know if he would. That's why we had the angst about us. We know he's capable of, of manipulating the, the system and putting them in their hands, but we just don't know if he is. So Matthew's teaching us, never doubt his power. He has got all power, but you submit to his will of what he is going to do. We're going to stop here. Thoughts, comments, or questions? Don't go further to the next one, please. We'll have Devil Ham next week. If he wanted, he could have had great fish come and swallow them all and spit them up on dry land. Or he could have said, guys, just get out of the boat. Peter, you're going to need to learn this later. Just get out and walk back to shore. But the, I, I'm still trying to get over the fact that they're all freaking out. And Jesus is somewhere in the boat. Water crashing over the boat's not bothering him. And don't think sea ship as in, you know, like the Nina, the Penta, and the Santa Maria, where there's a place you go and these are fishing vessels. They're open. His hair was wet with the spray. His cloak would have been wet with the water in the boat. His feet probably starting to shrivel up like the rest of them's. And he's asleep. If Jesus ain't doing something, maybe there's not as great of a problem as you think there is. And again, that didn't mean there wasn't a storm. There is a storm. There is water coming over the boat, but Jesus isn't panicking. If Jesus isn't panicking, you're fine. Now, if we ever get a note and an angel comes and says, guys, Jesus is in a panic. He's chewed his fingernails to a nub. It's time to freak out. But that we know that's not going to happen. Why? All authority and power has been given. Him. He's not going to. They don't have any comments or questions. And I still see some of them are still there, so I didn't lose them either. So we're not going to verse 31. Is that correct? Uh, no, ma'am. We're not even going into 28. We're done. Okay. We'll do the deviled ham next next Wednesday night. Lord willing. All right, let's pray. Lord, as we wrestle with what we have here, Father, the wrestling is going to come when we meet events in our lives that catch us off guard, that we don't have the power to remedy, right, fix, and we're going to be challenged even within our own selves to believe in your power. Lord, when that happens, would you please call this passage to our minds? Would your Holy Spirit remind us with your word that Jesus has been given all authority and power? May we encourage ourselves even right now with this truth that there is nothing Jesus cannot do. He can drive demons out. He can heal lepers. He can heal over distance. He can calm storms. He is capable of dealing with anything we face. 
Help us to trust, not in what we see, but in what your word tells us about your son. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us encouragement. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, fiddle.